I am um, happy to introduce our next speaker. Um, Dr. Anthony Luke is my co-chair here, and he is going to teach you how to do the knee exam. Um, Dr. Luke is also Canadian, as he mentioned earlier, and he did most of his training um, at U of T or Univers University of Toronto, um, undergrad residency medical school there. And then he went down to Boston and he did um, a primary care sports medicine fellowship and a master's of public health. Um, he's a very distinguished professor and teacher here at UCSF and has won multiple awards for teaching and mentoring and we're happy to have him. Um, so I'll let him take it away and then we'll take some more questions after if there's time. Hi, everyone. So uh, thanks, Dr. Lansdowne, for a great lecture on knee problems. We're going to talk now about the knee exam. So let's put this in action. So for a lot of the peripheral joints, I break things up into a simple look, feel, move, special tests approach. So for the knee, because we're looking at lower extremity, we're going to first look at alignment. So uh, Hallie's my model today. So uh, Hallie, if you don't mind taking your shoes off, I think that would be great. And it, for any lower extremity problem, it's just really helpful to get a good look at everything. So I'll have you look, go point toward the camera. And so um, I can look at her posture. And then if you put your feet right together, I can see how well her knees are aligned. And then if you go shoulder width apart, I'll get you to go on your tippy toes. And from here, I'm looking at her arches down there. And as you can see, she's got really nice arches, but as she comes down, you'll see if she rolls or not. So she does have a little bit of mobility. If you go on her toes again, you see how you reconstituted an arch. She's got a flexible arch and then she comes down and then she rolls a little bit. And that's really important because when the foot rolls, you see how the knee rolls. If I push it up, you see how her knee straightens up. Very important in something like for patellofemoral pain and things like that. So now I get her to walk, and this is all part of the look part, right? You've, before I even examine her, I see how she's walking to get on the exam table. If you just take a few steps, Hallie, just walking, and then come on back. And then you can kind of see how the foot and ankle and everything work together. Because think about not just the knee, feet, as well as the hips, and then the back. Now, um, there's a functional exercise. Like to say you're limited in time and you think this is an atraumatic problem, maybe kneecap pain, something like that. Uh, we can do a single leg squat test. Very, very helpful. So if you do a single leg squat there for me, hands on your hips and you're trying to control it, and you want to see if the knee buckles in, this is one of your best money functional tests. So let's try it one more time on the right. And so I want her knee to be pointing to the second toe. This is very helpful to see if she can control it, because it's actually her hip strength which is allowing her to control the knee and its rotation. So uh, you're going to learn a lot about this in the dance medicine talk if you go to Dr. Wingfield's talk. So let's try it on the left. So take a look on her left side here. A little bit more trouble. It's wobbling in a tiny little bit. And then come back up straight. And if you even just put feet together, Hallie, you'll notice that her left kneecap kind of points in. So again, just with alignment, you can get a little bit of suspicion that maybe there might be some mechanical issues. So do a single leg squat one more time. Now, is the knee going over the second toe? She's really got to work hard on her hip to do this and the hip talks coming up next. And we'll talk about how important those muscles are. Um, so when you think about kneecap pain and functional problems, don't just think about the knee, look at the foot, look at the hip. All right. So once I've done that, I get a good sense of how she's functioning. Obviously someone who's limping and things like that, you obviously there's something wrong with the knee. Now let's have her lie down and we're gonna continue on with look. So I'm going to bring this down. Now, as a simple mnemonic, you can look for certain things. Like uh, I have a mnemonic seeds, uh, swelling, erythema, atrophy, deformity, and surgical scars. So the first thing we'll look for is swelling. So if you take a look at the, her knees, the best place to look for uh, uh, swelling within the knees or an intraarticular effusion would be the dimples. So you can just even just observe it. I'll teach you a couple of ways on how to look for fluid and, and make it move, but 
a lot of times you're just looking, you're looking at the skin lines, you're looking if you've lost the concavity of the uh, inner border of the kneecap or the outer border, if you like. And then if it's full or one side's got a dimple and the other one doesn't, then that knee may have an effusion inside. So um, the other things we can look for are swelling, erythema, if it's red, swollen, you start thinking about things like gout or infection. Um, erythema, same thing. Uh, atrophy. At, for a chronic problem, like we talked about osteoarthritis in Dr. Lansdowne's talk, if someone's got a long-standing knee problem where they haven't been able to walk or use the leg properly, the number one area that they'll probably lose is the vastus medialis. It's the inner most uh, muscle for your quadriceps muscle. And so I'm going to get Hallie to just tighten her quadriceps. She's got a nice firm muscle. You kind of push into it. It's like you can feel her vastus medialis. If you do the other side, sometimes people, she's strong on both sides, but some people it'll feel like doughy. It, they just can't contract it. And you can compare side to side. But with a chronic problem, just look at the vastus medialis and see if they can contract it. Because if they cannot, then they may have some functional weakness. Okay. Uh, uh, then you can look at deformity. We already looked at her alignment before. And some people have surgical scars. She's got a scar maybe from an old abrasion or something like that. But sometimes people might have an incision suggesting an ACL reconstruction, uh, knee scope, or a total knee replacement if you have an older patient with a, a long linear scar in the front of the knee. Okay, so that's all done looking. That takes, you know, 20 to 30 seconds. Okay, so... Now we're gonna do the feel component. So one thing we wanna look for, we mentioned about swelling. Swelling is really important to find out, is it inside the knee or is it extra-articular swelling? Intra-articular swelling kind of points to all the problems that Dr. Lansdowne mentioned, which are meniscus tears, arthritis, something that's a problem inside the knee. You can often have bursitis. If you had swelling just on the kneecap, that might be prepatellar bursitis. Or if you have some swelling on the inside of the tibia and not even near the joint, that might be something we call pes anserine bursitis. So again, there are locations of swelling that can happen outside the knee joint, but it changes your differential based on what you're seeing. Okay, so look, feel, and now I'm gonna palpate. Now this is a really important point. Kneecap pain, as Dr. Lance, I mentioned, is probably your number one problem that you're going to see. So one thing I can do is I can firstly take the kneecap and move it around. Now, Howie is very flexible. If I divided the kneecap into quarters, normally you move like a quarter. In her, I can really move her over because she's very flexible. And some people will get apprehensive if you have someone who's dislocated their kneecap. It might, they might guard on you, and that's called the apprehension test. Now, to check for patellofemoral pain, the big thing is to get underneath the kneecap. So, put, so for the inside, I'm going to push the kneecap over and dig my finger underneath. And so if you want to even try that at home, just move your kneecap over, just bring your leg straight, but get your finger underneath because that's the articular side of the knee, like here's a right knee model. You got to get your finger underneath the kneecap. That's the articulating surface. So I might check on this side, see if it's tender. On the outside, get right underneath. And then if you wanted to palpate the patellar tendon, you can tip the touch on the top of the kneecap. It flips it up a little bit, and then you can feel the patellar tendon right over there. That's where people get jumper's knee or patellar tendinopathy. Okay, so that's the front of the knee. We're going to now bend her knee to 20 degrees, and then I'm going to run my thumb up the tibia until it hits a soft spot. You can almost, if you run your thumb up your own tibia, you'll feel that at, at the top of the tibia, it's, it gets into a soft spot. And then that's where the joint line is. So I'm going to kind of walk all the way across. Don't take your finger off, and you got to be pretty firm, feeling with the fat pads of your finger, get all the way to the back of the knee on both sides. So on this side, you can use your thumb or your index finger, and it's usually better to palpate with one finger only, because if someone says, ow, and you're pointing with two, you don't know, you got to clarify. If you're only pushing, they tell you, ow, okay, that's where their pain is. Because if you take a look at the model, all the 
key structures often are in the back of the knee. The meniscus tears usually get damaged in the back. If people get arthritis, again, it's going to be in the back of the knee. That's why the bent knee views. So again, just always get and palpate to the back of the knee. Okay, so that's look, feel. Uh, you could also feel things like the back of the knee. If you're feeling for a Baker cyst, you might feel for some fullness there. And then if you're thinking bursitis or IT band, all those things, then we can always palpate for those structures. So again, just takes, you know, 30 seconds to palpate the key areas. Now we're going to talk about move. So when you move the knee, we can see if she extends. So I take the, I keep her leg on the table and I just try to lift up gently and just see if it passively goes up. So Holly's maybe got like three degrees. You can kind of see her, her knee does hyperextend just a tiny little bit. And then you can just bend. So then I bend her, that would be like 90 degrees. And then if I keep going, I want to measure this angle. So again, she's very flexible. So she's getting around 150 degrees or so of flexion in the knee, which is probably the maximum you're going to get. She's like basically folded over right? Um, you don't get probably more than 150 degrees just because the shape of the leg. Okay. So that's look, feel, move. And I would actually say that if you think about all your patients who might've had any significant knee problem, that they probably had a problem in look, feel, move, whether you could palpate where it's problematic, they have a swollen knee or the knee's not moving because they have arthritis. Uh, that will at least tell you they're having a knee problem or not. Okay, so let's now get into some of the special tests. Okay, so uh, Dr. Lansdown went over the ACL tear. Everyone always likes to learn the ACL tear. So uh, the Lachman test, you bend the knee to 20 degrees, you fix the femur with one hand, and then with the other hand, you pull, hold the tibia firmly, and then you pull up kind of like you're starting a chainsaw or something. You're lifting up, like I'm lifting toward my belly button. And the amount of force that I'm pulling is around 15 pounds. That's how much you want to be pulling up. So imagine lifting a dumbbell or, or pulling something, 15 pounds. I'm fixing this so this can't move. I have her knee at 20 degrees because that's where the knee is the loosest. It's most mobile because the capsule's not tight. And I'm just pulling forward and see if she has an endpoint. And it's natural that people have maybe two to three millimeters of motion. You know, the knee's a flexible joint. It's not going to be totally stiff. Now that's for uh, one test uh, called the Lockman test. Another thing you can do is called the drop Lockman. If you only want to do one single test for the ACL, this is probably the easiest. Why don't you slide on over, Hallie? Um, I'm going to kind of drop her leg off the table. I'm going to keep her knee at around 20, 30 degrees. And now I've got both my hands free that I could kind of hold the tibia with both hands and then again, pull toward my belly button. You can kind of see maybe she's getting a little motion if you watch my thumbs. And so if you have small hands and you have someone with a big leg, this is probably the one single test that's the easiest to conduct and very sensitive. Great. And I can show you that if people want to see that again in the question and answer. Once you bend the knee to 90 degrees now, this is the classic anterior drawer test. I'm going to sit on her foot to stabilize the lower leg. I have both hands. I put my thumbs right on the joint line, and now I'm pulling toward myself. Again, 15 pounds or so of force. And then you can kind of see she's got a little tiny bit of motion here. Um, and, and then you can compare side to side. That's, she's naturally a little bit flexible. Always important to check both sides. Now, while I have her in this position, we can also check the posterior cruciate ligament. So that actually stops posterior translation. That's usually happens in something like a car accident in the classic dashboard injury or an athlete falls right on the tibia. So this time I push downward, again, 15 pounds of force, and I'm pushing with both hands down uh, in toward her. So that's the uh, anterior and the posterior door test. 
All right. So now let's talk about the lateral collateral ligaments. Dr. Uh, Lansdowne mentioned about the medial collateral ligament. If you take a look, this is the right knee. You've got this big ligament on the inside part of the knee, stops the knee from coming open. If it gets damaged, you're going to get some looseness. So this is how I do the MCL. I hold at the ankle. I bend the knee to 20 degrees again, because that's the angle that's the most loose. And then with the heel of my hand, I'm pushing 15 degrees of force this way. And you'll get a little give, but it'll stop. If it was damaged, you'll feel the joint open a little bit or it'll hurt. She just won't like it. So again, just pushing here. Now, if I want to do the lateral collateral ligament, I got to put the opposite force. So inside out, I kind of do it like by crossing my hand over and pushing outwards. And again, 15 pounds. So I'm pushing the force this way. Now, one thing I do is I like to leave the foot on the table because it takes a lot of energy to, to lift the leg. If you have a larger athlete, then again, it might be hard or awkward to kind of keep that up. So you can just get them at 20 degrees. But there are many different ways to examine the knee. You know, I have a lot of colleagues that kind of bring the leg into the armpit. They put their hands on the medial and collateral ligament. They kind of like push side to side. You can go on the inside part of the leg and push this way. Again, as long as you know the concepts, just be consistent on how you want to do it. And if you know how to apply the forces, you'll know how to do that test. So again, do what's comfortable for you. Uh, just be proficient at it. Okay, so let's talk about meniscus tears now. So meniscus tears, as you kind of see in the knee, you have those two little shock absorbers. Um, sometimes if there's a big tear, you're going to get some mechanical blocking in the joint. Maybe you'll lose range of motion. So already on look, feel, move, you're getting a sense that, yeah, the knee's not moving all the way and maybe there's an effusion or something like that. Um, so you gotta be careful with some of these tests. If you really think a young athlete has a bucket handle meniscus tear, you don't wanna be doing aggressive tests to them to try to elicit some pain. But, um, the uh, classic tests that are easy to do is the McMurray test. So what you want to do here is I like holding my hand on the top of the knee. That way I can control the whole leg. That gives me a free hand. So I'm kind of making sure she's comfortable, but I'm holding her knee up like this. Then with my free hand, I take the heel and then a little tip for a good McMurray test is you got to flex the knee as much as you can, because that's when things hurt. Remember, the meniscus tears are usually in the back. So even just hyperflexion, that's a meniscal test. So a lot of people get pain when they kneel or they squat. So I'm full, bringing it down. And now I can internally, like I can externally or internally rotate the foot. I'm holding at the bottom. If I internally rotate, the lower leg, I'm actually putting pressure on the lateral side of her knee. So it's like the direction of the heel is the direction you're putting pressure. So if I externally rotate her, I'm going to start putting a little more torquing pressure on the inside part of the knee. And I like to put my fingers on the joint line. So if there's a click or there's some pain or something uh, moves, I might be able to feel that. So again, just bringing it down and then you're kind of scouring it right when you get into the full flexion. So lateral side and then medial side. So that's a pretty practical way to do the tests pretty easily, but you just got to practice a few times. And tomorrow, if you do the hands-on sessions, we'll definitely be able to get you to practice on each other and really do it. Because once you get the hand position, you feel comfortable. Again, you can see it's fairly easy to go through those maneuvers pretty quickly. Um, one other meniscal test, I'm going to get Holly to come up and stand up. Um, if twisting is what bothers a meniscus, then this one's called the Thessaly test. So maybe turn toward me, uh, Holly. Then you hold the patient's hands and you maybe you'll stand on the left leg. So you can see. So I get them to bend to 20 degrees and then do the twist. So I'm going to kind of swing her, sort her balance, but she's going to twist on the knee. 
You don't want them to twist through the hips or the spine. You want them to really pivot right on the knee. So if you've ever done the twist before, that's this is what we want or a good twist. So that is a very sensitive test for getting the meniscal tears. So that's a, that's a practical one to add. So a lot of these knee exams, they're very sensitive, but not very specific. If you imagine, if you have a knee problem, for example, if I do the McMurray test and a patient has a meniscus tear or some arthritis or medial collateral ligament injury, those are all probably be fairly uncomfortable if I do that meniscus. The, the McMurray test on them. However, if you start adding things in your physical, add them to what you get on the, the history, then should be pretty easy to come to a kind of good working diagnosis by using these tests to confirm what you're thinking about. All right. Well, thank you, Hallie. Um, maybe with that, uh, I'll have time to demonstrate a few more things if there's a few more minutes. Happy to answer any questions. And uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. No questions at this time. But okay. Can you demonstrate an IT band test? Or okay. Band? Okay. No problem. So iliotibial band, iliotibial band attaches to the gluteal muscles and the tensor fascia lata up high, and then a band comes down, goes down on the lateral side of the knee, and usually inserts right in the spot called Gertie's tubercle. And so because the lateral femoral condyle flares out, some people get like a clicking or an irritation right over the lateral femoral condyle, or they get pain right on the insertion near Gertie's tubercle. In my experience, I see it's around 50-50, but the classic is usually explained on the lateral femoral condyle. So to check that out, why don't you lie down and I'll check the, the side that's closer to you guys so you guys can see. I can palpate along the IT band and you might almost kind of see there's a thickening right in this location. Again, I can feel it rubbing right underneath my thumb and then I kind of palpate on and that's already one telltale sign that that's gonna be, if that's irritating, they'll be sensitive either over the lateral femoral condyle or on this area, Gertie's tubercle. Now to see if she's tight, I have to turn her on her left side. So I get her to turn. You're going to bend your knees toward each other. You re might remember, uh, why don't you hold on to the lower leg? This is, if she was lying on her back, it's very similar to Dr. Uh, Berrigan's test where he, she, he did the Thomas test. Remember that? So that was for the hip flexor. This time I, we're going to get the lateral tissues. So we're getting her to lock her pelvis, get in the right position. Now I'm going to kind of hold the pelvis, abduct her leg, bring it around, and then put the heel at the level of her buttock. And if her leg's hanging up, which it is a tiny little bit, but it's neutral to the table, that's not too tight. Sometimes if they're hanging up like that, that's kind of tight. So, but if they're dropping at the level or usually they're even dropping below the table, that's helpful. Now, if I hold her leg up, then obviously her knee might look, look like it's holding up. So that's why you got to bring your hand down. So the foot is kind of at least at the level of the buttock. And you're really seeing if these tight tissues are holding the leg out. Now she's a little bit flexible at the joints, but that doesn't always mean she's going to be flexible at the IT band. So you can definitely have someone who's hypermobile complaining about IT problems, but this is called Ober's sign, O-B-E-R. And that's how you look for IT band tightness. All right. Thanks, everyone.